commentaries on the divine liturgy, the ecclesiastical history attributed to St. Germanos, patriarch of Constantinople, who died in 733, states in its opening chapter, the church is an earthly heaven in which the heavenly God dwells and moves. Ecclesia est in epigios uranos. You know, o uranios theos eniki ke em peripati. Now, Germanos was referring here, in the first instance, to the church building. But his words apply equally to the primary action that takes place within that building and that is the divine liturgy. The liturgy is in truth an earthly heaven, heaven on earth. Now, in my first talk, we looked at the liturgy in horizontal terms. We spoke of the unity that prevails here on earth among the visible participants in the Eucharist. Let's now <coughs> extend our visionary range and consider the liturgy in vertical terms as an action taking place simultaneously here on earth and in heaven. Now, this notion of the liturgy together with the church building in which it's celebrated as constituting heaven on earth, is frequently found in Greek and Russian sources. Let's remind ourselves of a few typical examples. First of all, here is the description by Procopius of the newly restored Cathedral of Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. He's writing in the 530s. The visitor's mind, he says, is lifted up to God and soars aloft, thinking that he cannot be far away 
but must especially love to dwell in this place that he himself has chosen. There certainly you have the idea of God being immediately <coughs> present in the church on earth, heaven on earth. And the same idea we can find in a sermon by Patriarch Photius of Constantinople, delivered around the year 864. <coughs> he offers a fine description of the program of church decoration in the period immediately following iconoclasm. He begins by speaking of the delight and wonder felt by the worshipper on entering the forecourt of the <coughs> church. The onlooker stands as if rooted to the ground. The facade of the church, says Photius, is a new miracle and a joy to see. But when with difficulty, continues St. Photius, one has torn oneself away from there and looked into the church itself with what joy and trepidation and astonishment one is filled. It is as if one had entered heaven itself. So there you have a classic description from St. Photius of the church as heaven on earth. It is as if one had entered heaven itself. And I'm sure when in due course you build your church here in this center uh, that we shall feel as we look at it that it is a new miracle and a joy to see and that when we go inside, we shall feel this is as if we had entered heaven itself. I look forward to that moment when I come back. <laughs> now, this same theme of heaven on earth comes out very notably in the well-known story of the conversion of the Russian do you remember that Prince Vladimir, while still a pagan, was visited <coughs> in Kiev by representatives of the different faiths? First of all, the Bulgar Muslims came to see him and explained their beliefs. And but when uh, Vladimir heard that the Muslims didn't allow you to drink strong liquor. <laughs> he said, this will never do for the <laughs> And then the German Catholics came, and the Jews, and finally a Greek scholar. Having listened to them all, Saint Vladimir uh, sent out emissaries to visit the different countries of the world to see at first hand what their faith was light, and the emissaries were not satisfied until they went to Constantinople. And there the Greeks took them to the divine liturgy in the church of Hagia Sophia. <coughs> and this is what they reported when they came home to their master, Vladimir. We knew not whether we were in heaven or on earth. For surely there is no such splendor or beauty anywhere upon earth. We cannot describe it to you. Only this we know, that God dwells there among men, and that their service surpasses the worship of all other places. For we cannot forget that beauty nor have the Russians ever forgotten 
this beauty in a thousand years of their history. Now, clearly, in promoting this idea of the church building and the liturgy as heaven on earth, <coughs> a vital role is played by the holy icon. When trying to think of a definition of what is a holy icon, I like to recall a phrase from the life of St. Stephen, the younger, who was a martyr in the cause of the icons in the 8th century. And he says the icon is a door. Tira legate, the icon, a door. And uh, we may ask, a door into what? In fact, we could say the icon as a door makes possible a two-way passage. The icon initiates us into heaven and it brings heaven to us. The essence of the icon is not just a visual reminder. It's not just a representation. But much more profoundly, the icon signifies participation through the icon. Christ, the Mother of God, the angels, the saints, come to us. Through the icon, we pass into the communion of saints. Participation. The icon fulfills a sacramental, mediatorial role. We can call the icon a symbol using the word symbol in its true and strong sense. Simvalin in Greek means to cast or throw together. So an icon, a symbol, symbolin, is that which draws together two levels of reality. And so exactly the icon draws together the visible and the invisible it draws together earth and heaven. So through the presence of the holy icons, we are enabled to enter heaven. Heaven comes to us. The church is made heaven on earth. <coughs> now let's apply this concept of heaven on earth more particularly to the divine liturgy. So Theodore of Mopsuestia says that the earthly service that we celebrate is an image, icon, of the liturgy in heaven. <coughs> and when we are worshipping at the divine liturgy, we should imagine we are in heaven. And this notion of the liturgy as being heaven is also a master theme in the preaching of St. John Chrysostom. The church, he says, is the place of the angels, of the archangels, the kingdom of God, heaven itself. And he says in another place, when the priest invokes the Holy Spirit, the angels attend him, and the whole sanctuary is thronged with heavenly power. When the curtain is drawn aside after the epiclesis, says St. John Chrysostom, so they did use a curtain in this time, and the curtain would have been drawn during the actual anaphora but drawn back again after the anaphora. 
when the curtain is drawn aside, he says, this um, symbolizes the opening up of heaven itself and the approach of the heavenly hosts. See the choir of angels coming to meet you. Ascend to heaven. When you see the Lord sacrificed and lying before you, says Chrysostom, and the priest standing over the sacrifice and praying, and all who partake stained and tinctured with that precious blood, can you imagine that you are still among men and still standing on earth. Are you not at once transported into heaven? Do you not gaze round upon heavenly things? So there we see how during the divine liturgy the earthly and the heavenly realms are joined in unity whether few or many the members of the earthly congregation invariably form part of a larger all embracing drama they are taken up into an action far greater than themselves the divine liturgy is all the undivided offering of the total church, both visible and invisible. Those on earth are made concelebrants of the heavenly liturgy with Christ himself, with the mother of God, with the angels and the saints. Now let's turn to the actual service of the liturgy and see how this notion of heaven on earth is worked out. It's present from the very outset. Before beginning the liturgy, the celebrant raises his hands to heaven and says, Doxa in ipsistis theos, kevigis irini, an anthropis evdokia. Glory be to God on high and on earth peace, goodwill among men. There, at the very outset, you see indicated the two levels on which the liturgy is being celebrated. There is the glory on high in heaven and then peace here below on earth. So there's a clear indication there of these two levels, <coughs> earthly liturgy and the heavenly liturgy. Now let's compare these two levels. The earthly liturgy takes place as an event in a particular spot. The heavenly liturgy takes place everywhere because heaven is not a geographical point in space. Heaven is a level of reality. The earthly liturgy takes place as an event in time. It begins at a particular moment and ends at a particular moment. On the other hand, the heavenly liturgy takes place in eternity, not in time. The earthly liturgy takes place verbally, through words and gestures. The heavenly liturgy takes place ontologically. Christ does not say the heavenly liturgy. He does not recite it. Christ is the heavenly liturgy. The earthly liturgy is the clergy and the people who offer bread and wine. But in the heavenly liturgy, it is Christ who offers himself. 
Now, what happens during the Eucharistic celebration is precisely at the consecration, at the epiclesis of the Holy Spirit, these two levels, earthly and heavenly, are united. Our offering is taken up into Christ's self-offering and identified with it. Bread and wine become the Savior's body and blood. Using metaphorical language, we can say either up or down, but the meaning is the same. We, the <coughs> celebrants of the earthly liturgy, go up to heaven, or we can say the heavenly liturgy comes down to earth. But the same truth is expressed when you say up or down. The realms of earth and heaven are no longer separated. They are united. Each realm embraces the other. So that's something of what we can read into those opening words of the liturgy. Glory be to God on high and on earth peace, goodwill among men. When I'm celebrating at home in Oxford, I always wait for them to finish singing the great doxology and then I say those words aloud in the hearing of the people because it's very important for understanding the whole action of the liturgical responses. Now, this unity of earth and heaven is reaffirmed in what follows immediately after the words, Lord said, if ceased is there, glory be to God on high. The deacon turns to the celebrant. Now, unfortunately, <coughs> deacons have become very rare in the Orthodox Church today. There often seem to be more bishops around than deacons. <laughs> <laughs> but in principle, we should have at least one deacon in every parish. Because the outward celebration of the liturgy is not complete without the deacon. Of course, the spiritual reality of the liturgy is not impaired when there is no deacon, but the outward expression is certainly diminished. The deacon's role is something essential in the liturgy. <coughs> I'm always very disturbed when editions of the liturgy are published which simply omit any reference to the deacon, as if he didn't exist. And such um, translations are incomplete, even if we don't have deacons, people at least should be reminded that there should be a deacon there. <laughs> One of the questions that needs to be discussed in our Orthodox Church today is how to revive the diaconate, but that's not my theme today. <laughs> so the deacon then turns to the priest, this is before the initial blessing, and he says to the priest, Keros tu piise to kirio. Now, sometimes that is translated as it is time for us to begin the service to the Lord. That's the translation that you will find in the OCA uh, version of the Divine Liturgy. But that, I think, is not the best rendering of the Greek words. I think it should be translated, <coughs> it is time for the Lord to act. Um, in other words, the phrase does not mean it's time for us to start doing something, but it's time for the Lord. <laughs> In fact, that is a translation from Psalm 118. 
alias 119 versus 126. And if you look it up in almost all the modern versions of the Bible, based on the Hebrew, they all say it is time for the Lord to act. This is a very important phrase for understanding the liturgy. And it's pity that because there isn't usually a deacon, those words are not usually said. Because this phrase reminds us, first of all, the liturgy is not just words, but an action. And secondly, it is not merely our action, but the action of the Lord. The liturgy is something at which Christ, the invisible high priest, is the celebrant. And we, clergy and people together, are merely concelebrants <coughs> with Christ. The, litur the earthly liturgy is one with the heavenly liturgy because there is only a single celebrant <coughs> on both levels. And that celebrant is Christ himself. So we as priests, whenever we are about to begin the divine liturgy, should always remind ourselves as we stand before the holy table, Christ is here standing before the holy table. It's Christ who is offering the divine liturgy. I am merely joined with Christ, serving with him and under him. We should never celebrate the liturgy without having vividly before us, in the eyes of our heart, the immediate presence of Christ, the one true priest. St. John Chrysostom says, that it is Christ who performs everything. The priest merely <coughs> provides his hand and lends his voice. That reminds me of an occasion where once I had to go and celebrate <coughs> the liturgy at a city some way from Oxford, and I was somewhat upset because I had fallen down and broken my hand and it's very difficult to celebrate the liturgy and to give communion with only one hand. So I hope to get a, another priest to come and help me at the service. And he arrived but he was very upset because he had completely lost the use of his voice. <laughs> Between us we managed. One priest provided his voice and the other priest provided his hand. Yes. So, think then of the unity between the earthly and the heavenly liturgies affirmed in that opening phrase, glory be to God on high and on earth peace. Think then of the deacon's phrase, it is time for the Lord to act. Christ is the one true celebrant at the divine liturgy. And there is the same celebrant in heaven and on earth. The role of Christ as the true priest in the service is underlined in the well-known words of the prayer during the Cherubic hymn. Sigari o prospero ke o prosperomenos. You are the one who offers and who is offered. <clears throat> Christ is both the offerer and the offering. He is both priest and victim. The presence of Christ is again underlined in the exchange of the kiss of peace at the recitation of the creed. Where we say to one another, For Christos en to meso 
Christ is in our midst. Two occasions in particular when the unity of earth and heaven is expressed with particular clarity are the entrances. First of all, the little entrance, the entrance with the book of the Gospels <coughs> in the prayer that the priest says he speaks of the ranks of her and hosts of angels and archangels who perform the liturgy in heaven and in that prayer he says to God make with our entry an entry of your holy angels celebrating the liturgy with us. So there very clearly we have the idea that at the little entrance as the visible clergy go into the sanctuary at the same time invisibly the hosts of angels are making an entry into the sanctuary. And this idea of the unity between earth and heaven, the participation of the heavenly powers in the liturgy is then emphasized in the chanting of the Trisagion. Holy God, holy strong, holy immortal. This is the hymn, holy, 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 that is being sung in heaven. And so we here on earth, having entered the sanctuary with the angels, sing with them the thrice holy hymn, the Trisagion. <coughs> so there you see at this moment of the little entrance, earth and heaven are united. Unfortunately, the prayer at the entry is not heard by the people, <coughs> and I suspect celebrants often say it in a rather hurried way as they're bustling out with the Gospel book. But it is a very important prayer. Make with our entry an entry of your holy angels. Of the Russian Saint Seraphim of Sarov, <coughs> it is recorded that one Holy Thursday when he was celebrating in the monastic church as a deacon, he saw with his bodily eyes at the moment of the little entry, or just afterwards, just before the Trisagion, he saw Christ coming into the church accompanied by a great number of angels like a swarm of bees, he said. And then Christ moved up through the church and entered his icon in the icon screen. And the angels all went into the sanctuary. And for many hours, St. Seraphim could not speak. He was so overcome by that vision. But what he saw happens every time we celebrate the liturgy. So we don't have the eyes of faith of St. Seraphim to see it. Then the second procession, the great entrance, renders the unity of earth and heaven even more explicit. Because the Keruvikon, which accompanies the processional entry with the holy gifts, begins with the words, Ita Keruvim mysticos iconizontes. And that's usually translated, uh, we who mystically represent the <coughs> But the word represent is inadequate. Represent is rather a dry and uninteresting word. Uh, I'm a representative of the University of Oxford, 
but that's not a very interesting thing to say. Is it? So I think uh, represent is an inadequate translation. We ought to translate it, we who mystically or in this mystery are icons of the church. Now, an icon, as I just said, involves participation. It's not just a representation, an icon, but it unites you with that which it depicts. So if we say we are icons of the charity, that doesn't just mean we represent the charity in a kind of external, visual way. It means that we are sharing and participating in the action of the charity. We on earth are doing what the cherubim are doing in heaven. We share in their action. On earth and in heaven there is only a single action. That's the real meaning of Econizon. We who are icons of the cherubim, acting with them, united with them. And the same point is made much more clearly at the great entrance in the liturgy of St. James, where the entrance hymn is, Let all mortal flesh be silent. <coughs> we do sing um, on Holy Saturday. Now there we say in that hymn, the King of Kings, Christ our God, comes forth to be sacrificed and given us food to the faithful. Before him go the choirs of angels with every principality and power, the cherubim with many eyes, and the six-winged seraphim. <coughs> so that hymn, Sigi Sato, Pasa Sat that all mortal flesh keep silence, is a very clear proclamation of the unity of earth and heaven. One single shared action. And the same point was very clear at the great entrance today in the celebration of the pre-sanctified gifts when we sang now the powers of heaven worship with us invisibly I always look forward to Lent not because we should be eating Baba and Halva but I look forward to them because I shall hear that hymn. Now the powers of heaven worship with us in visit. This idea of the single action of earth and heaven is underlined in the frescoes that you will sometimes see in Byzantine churches, most commonly in the drum of the dome. There you see a representation of the great entrance. You see um, one, several figures carrying <coughs> candles and Rikidia. You see a figure with the incense. You see the a figure dressed in deacon's vestments carrying the holy gifts, the bread. And behind you see a figure in priestly vestments carrying the chalice. And you see another figure in episcopal vestments waiting for the procession at the entrance of the sanctuary. But in this fresco, the figures who are dressed in the vestments of subdeacon, deacon, and priest, they all have wings. They are all angels. And the figure 
who is waiting at the entrance to the sanctuary to receive the gifts, is Christ himself. So in that representation of the angels performing the great entrance, you have a visual illustration of the theme I've been seeking to develop, the unity of earth and heaven. As St. John Chrysostom affirms, those in heaven and those on earth form a single festal assembly. There is shared thanksgiving, one single choir. <coughs> now the clearest affirmation of the unity of earth and heaven in the liturgy comes a little later on in the anaphora. It comes when the celebrant says, we thank you also for this liturgy which you have been pleased to accept from our hands. Though there stand around you thousands of archangels and tens of thousands of angels, the cherubim and the seraphim, six-winged and many-eyed, soaring aloft upon their wings, singing, crying, shouting the triumphal hymn and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Now there exactly, very explicitly <coughs> this time, we find an affirmation of the unity of earth and heaven of the participation of the angels and archangels in the same act of praise that we are performing on earth. So there, above all, the idea of the earthly heaven <coughs> is made completely clear. There's a story that I remember from my days as an Anglican. Once upon a time there was a priest, country priest, and he was always having a long-standing quarrel with the local farmer who had his lands just next to the church. And the priest watched one weekday, the, uh, the, the farmer watched one weekday leaning over the wall as the priest went in to perform the morning service and nobody else came. So when the priest emerged from the church and the farmer was still looking over the wall, <laughs> Anglican services don't take as long as Orthodox services. <laughs> the farmer said to the priest, you didn't have very many people this morning, did you? said the priest, we had quite a number. How many, said the farmer? Oh, a good many thousands, said the priest. You're a liar, said the farmer. I've been watching all this time, and nobody went into the church except you. Oh no, said the farmer. We had thousands of archangels and tens of thousands of angels, <laughs> among others there at the service. And that's, of course, true, that when we celebrate the liturgy, we are never alone. We are always taken up into an action far greater than ourselves. Let me illustrate that by uh, two experiences of my own. They, neither of them relate directly to the divine liturgy, but they do concern other liturgical actions, and the principle of heaven on earth applies not just to the liturgy, but to every act of worship. The first experience concerns my initial acquaintance with orthodoxy. When I was 17 years old, 
I was wandering through a part of London that I didn't know, and I saw a church with which I was unfamiliar. And so, out of curiosity, or perhaps by divine providence, I decided to go inside. It was a hot, sunny Saturday afternoon. And the church which I went into was, in fact, the Russian church in London. <coughs> when I entered the church at first, it was dark. I could see nothing. Then I became conscious of a large expanse of polished floor, because there were no pews in the church. And my initial sense was, this church is completely empty. But then I realized, as my <coughs> eyes became accustomed to the darkness, that it wasn't entirely empty. I saw that there were icons around the walls with lighted lamps in front of them. I saw that there was an icon screen with many lighted candles in front of it at the east end. I saw that there were a few people, not very many, elderly people standing near the walls of the church. And then after a time a deacon emerged from behind the screen. And I realized somewhere out of sight there was a choir singing. At this point, my initial impression that the church was empty was completely reversed. And I felt this church is not empty, it is full. It is full of invisible presences. It is full of invisible worshippers. I cannot see them, but they are present here immediately. And I had exactly this feeling that we, the small visible congregation, were being taken up into a reality far greater than ourselves. I had exactly the sense that the Russian emissaries had, but at that point I'd never read about St. Vladimir, that this was heaven on earth. I felt that we, this earthly congregation, were being taken up into the worship of heaven, that I felt that the saints and the angels are here, the Mother of God is here, that Christ himself is officiating at the service. And it was that experience at the vigil service on the Saturday evening in London when I was 17 that drew me to join the Orthodox Church, though I waited six years before I did so. So what brought me to the Orthodox Church was not reading books or meeting other Orthodox Christians. What brought me to the Orthodox Church was the experience of worship as heaven on earth. And that's why I particularly wanted to develop this theme with you this morning. But let me mention another experience which I had in our church in Oxford. I was performing one Sunday evening an Evkelia, a service of anointing for an elderly lady in our congregation. She was well enough to come to the church, so she had not much longer to live, and so we did the anointing service in the church itself. And there were just three of us there. The old lady, a friend who'd come with her and who read the responses, and I, the officiating priest. And we were each holding a candle. And as we celebrated the service, it gradually grew dark. After the service was over, I saw some people waiting, two or three, at the entrance of the church. So I went to talk with them, and they were Greeks who happened to be passing through Oxford, who'd 
decided just to look in at the church. And they said to me, where are all the others? I answered, what do you mean? All the others who were at the service, they said. No, I said to them, uh, there's just the three of us here at the service. Oh no, they said, we came earlier and through the uh, windows of the church we could see hundreds of people standing with lighted candles mm -hmm. and we could hear a large choir singing but we didn't like to come in. Oh no, I said, it's just been the three of us there. But then I thought afterwards, it is never just the two or three of us. Always, whenever we pray, we are taken up into the worship of heaven. Now, forgive me for mentioning those two examples from my own experience. I expect some of you in your priestly ministry have also had similar experiences. Thank you.